Good evening, ladies. Before we talk about this week's lesson, let's first hear from our children's supervisor, Kay. Hello, my name is Kay, and I'm a children's supervisor with Bible Study Fellowship. I wonder if you know what these have in common. A device, a Bible, a discovery guide, children's leaders, and students ages 5 to 18. Well, if you've guessed Bible Study Fellowship Richmond Evening Women's Student Program, you would have guessed right. Our online class runs every Monday starting at 6.45 with classes starting at 7 p.m. We welcome all students in your life. Reach out to us through bsf.rew.john at gmail.com. We look forward to meeting the students in your life. When my son was about two years old, one day we went to see our family doctor. When we were waiting at the clinic, there was a poster on the wall that caught my son's attention. The poster was about preventing SID, sudden infant death. A young couple kneeling in front of a baby's body crying. My son asked me, Mom, what happened to that baby? At that time, we have not heard about the gospel and did not know Jesus. I thought it may be time to tell him about death and life. So I answered, Oh, the baby died and his parents are so sad, so they are crying. My son then immediately asked, Mom, what if I die? He looked so worried and fearful. My husband looked at me as if he was asking, how should we answer? I immediately regretted that I answered the question too straightforward. I should have avoided it or at least made it softer. My mind spins quickly for a few seconds and I said, don't worry, you will be back in mom's stomach and you will be born again. My son seemed so relieved, and I can see that the worry on his face disappeared. My husband gave me a thumbs up to confirm that it was a good answer. But that didn't last long. Soon after, my son made some friends who have siblings. He came back and questioned my answer. He said, Mom, if I die and you have another baby, it will be my baby sister or baby brother. It won't be me. What if I die? Where will I go? At this time, I did not know how to answer. I did not want to lie. I tried to find answers from books and some articles from magazines, but not from the Bible because I didn't know Jesus yet. However, no answer was satisfactory to my son. For the following a few years, he would bring up this topic from time to time and even question why he should study at school, learn to play the piano, and exercise. Because if he would die anyways, he said he would prefer to eat his favorite food and play his favorite games every day and then choose a time and way to die because he hates uncertainty. That makes me and my husband worried, even to the point of panicking. Life and death is the ultimate question for all mankind. This week in John's Gospel, chapter 3, a Jewish religious leader named Nicodemus came to Jesus, asked a similar question, how could a person be born again? And in this chapter, Jesus gave the perfect answer to Nicodemus, to my son, and to all of us. Let's study this chapter in two divisions. The first division is new life in Jesus. John chapter 3 verses 1 to 21. 
And the second division is testimony about Jesus. John chapter 3, verses 22 to 36. So why did Nicodemus come to Jesus? From the passage we studied last week, obviously Jesus' remarkable teaching, his amazing miracles, and his disruptive clearing of the temple courts no doubt created concerns among the Jewish leadership. But they also created curiosity, and one of them is Nicodemus. He wants to seek to better understand who Jesus is. Nicodemus represents the spiritual blindness of the religious leaders of Jerusalem. They were the ones who held religious power among the Jews, and they were the ones who made sure the Jews abided by the law and onerous religious rules and regulations they had developed through the years that were not necessarily aligned with scripture. Jesus was a threat to their power and called them out for their hypocrisy. They were the ones who would eventually pave the way for Jesus to be crucified. That explains in part why Nicodemus, a well-placed, prominent, and powerful person, came to Jesus at night. If they had known of this meeting, it would be seen as if he was complicit with the enemy. He had much to lose, primarily his status and reputation among his peers. But Nicodemus' curiosity was genuine. He, know, he knew something was missing. So Nicodemus approached Jesus. He said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus responded in verse 3 by making a solemn pronouncement. Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of heaven unless they are born again. The Greek word born again can also mean from above, born again, born from above. While Jesus is referring to spiritual rebirth, Nicodemus misunderstands him to refer to a second physical birth. In verse 4, he says, How can someone be born when they are old? Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. In verse 5, Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. What does it mean to be born of water? It does not refer to physical birth, obviously, and it does not refer to water baptism either, because salvation comes by faith alone, not by any human work like baptism. Here, the water refers to spiritual cleansing, which is illustrated and symbolized by water baptism. Water often represents the cleansing, the life-giving power of God's word. To be born of water is to be cleansed of our sins through faith in Jesus. The new birth that Jesus was talking about is the new life of salvation that Jesus and only Jesus offers. Every single person except Jesus was born into a sinful state. Because of Adam and Eve's original sin in the garden, as recorded in Genesis 3, we have inherited their sinful nature. And there is a penalty that must be paid for the sin for which we are responsible and will be held accountable. But Jesus came to take our place and bear the punishment we deserve to suffer the death that we were bound to before we were drawn to believe in him as our Savior and Lord. Through faith in the Word, faith in Jesus, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit, God himself, who dwells within us. The Spirit of God in us allows us to understand God and his Word 
to be molded more and more into his likeness in our days on earth. At the same time, we are sealed or marked to be in God's presence for eternity by his spirit. Through this gift of faith, we are eternally secure in Jesus. And this is what it means to be born again, to be made new today and to live in glory with God forever. New birth was a spiritual rebirth that will eventually lead to a physical glorious life in the new kingdom to come. Through faith in Jesus, salvation through Jesus, we are reborn to his spirit. He redeems and replaces our fallen spirit. His spirit gives us all the blessings we need to love, to listen, and to learn the ways of God. His spirit leads us to joyfully live a life of obedience. His spirit enlightens us to know and understand when we sin, desire to repent from sin and follow God's way. Through his spirit, we become God's witness in the world, casting his light in the darkness so others may be drawn to his truth and love. Coming to faith is the work of the Holy Spirit. Faith is a gift and work of God that a person is moved to accept. Jesus said in verse 8, The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. God is sovereign. He determines when and where it will rain. He knows the number of planets in the universe, just as he knows the number of hairs on your head. It's his spirit who draws men, women, boys, and girls to faith in his son, Jesus Christ. While we cannot and do not control the spirit, there is a responsibility on our part. Do we accept the invitation of faith in Jesus Christ, which brings eternal life with him? Or do we reject him, what he has done, and what he promises? If we choose the latter, we take full responsibility of our sin and will bear its punishment of eternal death and separation from God. Unbelievers live in the fallacy that they are in control of their lives. But truly, the ruler is the devil, the prince of the air, the prince of the world. The only, only way out is to put our faith, our hope, and our trust in Jesus Christ. We believe he is the Messiah. We believe he bore the full weight of our sins and took on the judgment we deserve. We believe he rose from the dead. We believe we are indwelt with the Holy Spirit, who shows us what the Father desires and what he is doing. We believe we will rise with him into new, glorious, and eternal life when our physical life on earth is over. In faith, with the indwelling Holy Spirit, we will know where we are going with Jesus forever. In verse 10, Jesus rebukes Nicodemus for failing to understand spiritual realities. You are Israel's teacher, and do you not understand these things? He goes on to verse 12 to say, I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if, if I speak of heavenly things? Jesus then goes on to explain what such heavenly truths are available only through the Son of Man who's come down from heaven. He must be lifted up at, like the serpent that Moses lifted up in the wilderness so that those who believe in him may receive eternal life. Here Jesus draws another analogy to the Old Testament. In Numbers chapter 21, the people of Israel complain against God. So in judgment, God sends poisonous snakes into their camp, 
when the people repent of their sin, God instructs Moses to make an image of a snake made of bronze and set it up on a pole in a camp. Those who respond in faith by looking at the snake are saved. Jesus said, Just as this snake is raised up, so Jesus, the Son of Man, will be raised up, meaning raised up on the cross and then raised to resurrection life. Whoever looks to him in faith will receive eternal life. This is another Old Testament symbol of salvation. Just as the people of Israel were physically saved by looking to the snake on the pole, we are spiritually saved by looking in faith toward the crucified and risen Messiah. What follows then is the most famous verse in the Bible, John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God's love, a fundamental character trait of God, is the motivation for his salvation. This love prompted him to make the ultimate sacrifice, the gift of his son. Salvation now comes to those who accept this free gift of salvation by faith. Those who believe will receive eternal life. This is the whole gospel in a nutshell. No wonder John chapter 3 verse 16 is so famous. Verses 16 to 21 summarize not only the central theme of John's gospel, they summarize the central theme of the whole Bible. God loves the world in this way. He sent his one and only son to save us. Those who believe in him receive eternal life. Those who reject him stand condemned because they have turned their back on God's gracious offer of salvation. The need for light exists because mankind experiences life in the realm of darkness. People do not even realize they are in the darkness because their motives Desires and passions are of a darkened nature, such that they avoid the light instinctively and enjoy the darkness. The basis of divine judgment is the rejection of the light. The reason for the rejection is a love of our sinful ways more than a love for God. Not wanting our sins exposed. A lack of humility keeps mankind from the gift of life and salvation. Such unwillingness is the ground of a just condemnation. Jesus gives all humanity a black and white choice. Using John's words, it's a verdict. Guilt in our sin or innocence in Jesus. We do not deserve the salvation. There is nothing we can do to deserve it. The only thing we deserve is death. And Jesus took that on for us. All we need to do is believe. This is salvation. Out of an abundance of love, God offers salvation freely. And through faith, we are declared innocent, freed from our debt, and given eternal life with God. Through his light, we are plucked from the darkness, which is also eternal, but also complete and utter separation from God. Separation from God is agony. It is literally hell. Those who refuse to be saved by Jesus Christ are traveling in that hopeless direction. That leads us to our first principle, which is Jesus' purpose is to save people for eternity. Jesus' purpose is to save people for eternity. This world offers the beauty and wonder, but it is broken because of the sin of mankind. Yet Jesus boldly, courageously, knowing his own life was at stake, did not hesitate to come to us to save us from eternal disaster. He came with urgency. 
He came to save those he loved. He came to show us a way out, and it cost him his life. Do you understand what Jesus has done for you? Do you believe it? Do you believe him? Do you believe in him? And because this is a matter of eternal life and death, who in your life needs to know the new life of salvation that Jesus offers? Following Nicodemus' episode, John the Baptist gave his testimony to Jesus in our Division Two of today's study, in verses twenty-two to thirty-six. From last week's passage. We know that John baptized Jesus, revealed that Jesus is the Lamb of God. Now John the Baptist continued to practice in the baptism of repentance. While this was not the baptism of salvation, admission of and repentance from sin are necessary in the salvation of a believer. So John was baptizing on one part of the river; Jesus is baptizing on the other. John's disciples come to him and express their concern that Jesus is baptizing and gaining more followers than John. If this were a competitive market, Jesus was taking away from John his spiritual market share, and to John's disciples, this is a problem. John is losing the popularity contest. In today's terms. Perhaps John should consider rebranding or do some better marketing, or maybe create some negative advertising so that John could get some of his clients back. That is how the world would look at the situation if it were today. But unlike his disciples, John did not have a worldly will. He had a heavenly will because the Holy Spirit was upon him. John's view was never to point to himself, but to the one, the only one, Jesus Christ. His job was to pave the way for the Messiah, just like the patriarchs and the prophets before him. He says in verse twenty-seven, "You yourselves can testify that I said, 'I'm not the Messiah, but I'm sent ahead of him.' The bride belongs to the bridegroom." The friend who attends the bridegroom awaits and listens for him, and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. The joy is mine, and it is now complete. Scripture refers to Jesus as the bridegroom and the church as his bride. I think of John the Baptist as being Jesus' best man. He is the one carrying the ring, the one who stands next to Jesus. Not the center of attention, but the one who stands up at the banquet and testifies to the bridegroom's character. He stands with Jesus, but is not the central figure. The bridegroom, Jesus Christ, is. John subordinates himself and exalts Jesus as the Messiah. In verse thirty, he says, "He must become greater; I must become less." John is a model disciple because he doesn't receive glory for himself, but always points others to Christ. Unlike Jesus, John had an earthly conception and birth. He was born a sinner and is part of his of this fallen world. He is redeemed only through faith in his Savior Jesus, as verses thirty one to thirty two describe. Who comes from heaven? And is above all the one who testifies as to what he has seen and heard. But despite all that Jesus says regarding his heavenly perspective and authority, no one accepts his testimony. Today, the vast majority reject the gift of salvation that Jesus offers. The Spirit of God is who draws believers to Jesus Christ, and through His Spirit, from the lips of Jesus and from the lips of those who believe in Him, their testimony about Him is true. Verses thirty-two and thirty-four says, "Whoever has accepted it, meaning the truth about Jesus, has certified that God is truthful. For the one whom God has sent speaks the words of God." 
for God gives the Spirit without limit. Jesus Christ was filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit spoke through John the Baptist. The Holy Spirit indwells believers, and the Holy Spirit is alive and active today, drawing people to Jesus, becoming a part of them, and being His witness throughout the world. This chapter closes restating the truth that had been proclaimed in three sixteen, verse thirty five. The Father loves the Son and has placed everything in His hands. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. Here, John, the Gospel writer, has pulled the fire alarm. This is an urgent message. The world is fallen. The Savior has come. Come to Him. Believe in Him. Accept the gift of salvation. Live with Him forever. So here comes our second principle for today: A Christian's highest purpose is to turn people's attention to Jesus. A Christian's highest purpose is to turn people's attention to Jesus. We live in a world where we often hear emphasizes of I, self, and me. Whether it's a subtle humble brag on social media or directly asking for attention for things done, people's priorities tend to be centered on themselves, and that is true for me. I can't help it. It is part of my fallen nature, and it's a constant battle to fight. John the Baptist was at the same time one of the most popular people. Of his day, but being a remarkably humble person, he knew his calling and was undisturbed with his disciples becoming Jesus followers. Do we have a willingness to be second, or do we like to be in the limelight, and so that at times we obscure the true light? John understood his mission clearly. Do we? Are you willing to decrease? So that Christ might be seen more. Our primary focus and allegiance ought to be on Jesus Christ. He has made everything possible. As a creator, He made our existence possible. As sustainer, He has provided everything we need to live on this earth. As our Savior, He has given us new life by taking on the death penalty we deserve and giving us eternal life with Him. And we are all undeserved. So, if we step back and honestly look at ourselves and our state, why on earth do we give ourselves the attention we don't deserve? Let's turn our attention, our affections, and our glory. To God, my family was blessed by having a two-year-old little Nicodemus, my son, asking the question, "How could I be born again?" His question led our family to the church, where we were all found and saved by Jesus. In Jesus, we are forgiven our sins and given a new birth and new life. Beyond our days on earth, Jesus promises a glorious eternity with Him. We will be made whole in body, mind, and spirit. We will enjoy the presence of our Savior forever. That is glory. That is what the gift of salvation brings. That is our hope. That is our assurance. That is our future. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Point others to Him, and thank God that we have the joy and privilege to be part of His rescue team. Let's pray, dear Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus. Thank you for your love, so much love that you gave your one and only Son to us, despite that we are unworthy sinners, so that through believing in you. We will not perish, but have eternal life. May the Holy Spirit give each of us a humble heart. 
to always exalt you and give all glories to you, but not to ourselves. Point others to you because you are the one and only one, holy one of salvation by sacrificing yourself. May you use us to make your name known so that more people can see your kingdom. All these we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. <music>